Good morning, my name is Katie Yates and I am a public relations specialist for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Today, welcome to our monthly coffee chat series where I meet with different staff from our department to chat about recreation management and conservation over some coffee. Today I am uh, catching up with black bear and Canada lynx biologist Jen Vashon to talk about Maine's robust bear population and avoiding conflicts with bears. For those of you watching at home, you can join the conversation anytime by typing in your questions in the chat box and we will answer questions towards the end of the conversation and as time allows. And just as a reminder, this video is recorded so you can um, watch it later or, or share with friends and family. So Jen, how are you doing today? You just caught me taking a sip of my tea. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm honestly missing the sun. It was really nice early this week and I'm hoping we'll see the sun soon, but I'm excited to be here this morning. Yeah, we've had some really great weather. Yes, we and have. I, I have to say I don't mind rainy days because it's easier to work. <laughs> so uh, why don't you just explain for everyone at home what it is exactly that you do for the department? Yeah, I'm a wildlife biologist. Uh, I'm really fortunate. I get to work with two really amazing animals. Uh, I specialize in the management of black bears at Canada Lynx. So one's a game species, the black bear, and Canada lynx are a non-game species. So it really provides me a really diverse opportunity to kind of do different things based on different management needs for two species. Um, early in my career, I spent a lot of time in the field, like many wildlife biologists, doing the fun things that everyone thinks you do as a biologist, going out there capturing and radio calling black bears and Canada lynx. And I worked with a variety of other species but now as the state bear and lynx biologist, I spend a lot of time actually just managing the data that we collect. And so uh, we collect a lot of different data. And so when we get that information, we really need to assimilate it, understand what it means and use that information to help make some of our decisions. And so um, one way to think of it is um, if we wanna do a census of the human population, we just simply call households and ask how many people live in your household, those kinds of things. With black bears, you can't really call and ask them how many bears are in your family. You need to figure out how many bears are out there on the landscape. They're cryptic, that you don't see them very easily. They live in a dense forested habitat. And so it requires that we go out there and capture them. And so that's like some of the exciting things that we do. But then when we, we collect a ton of information, when we capture these animals, we're looking at how many are born each year, how many survive, lots of information. And then we also get a lot of information from our hunters because they're a game species. And so that provides us a lot of information on how many bears are out there in the population because that hunted population is like a snapshot of the entire population. And so it's really exciting to actually get to use all that information and bring it all together and get a clear picture of what's going on um, as clear as you can with wildlife. And so we use that information to inform a lot of our decisions. That is a lot to keep track of. <laughs> so uh, I think we might be having an early spring. We were kind of just mentioning how nice the weather has been. So what does that mean for Maine's bears and what are they up to right now? Yeah, so this time of year, bears are emerging from their winter dens. They've been hibernating all winter, sleeping off their fat reserves. And so when they emerge from the winter den, they're in probably their poorest condition that they're gonna be for most of the year. And so what they need to do is um, really find some food resources. In the spring, you're outside right now, we're all waiting for that green up, so are bears. They're waiting for everything to green up. And so um, there's not a lot of natural foods out there for them. And so unfortunately this time of year, because there's not a lot of natural foods, bears will often um, take some risks that they wouldn't take in other times of the year, and they might seek out food resources in people's backyards. And so that's one of the things that we kind of gear up this time of year, is thinking about what can we do to prevent bears from going into people's backyards and causing conflicts. Great, thank you. And what are some of those things that bears might be looking for? I guess, what's, what are some common complaints that you get from people, um, you know, when bears are in their, in their backyard? Yeah, I think the two top ones um, are bird feeders and garbage. 
a lot of people really enjoy feeding birds. Um, and I actually did, you know, early on, but I had a bear visit in my yard. And so that changed my behavior um, in terms of not wanting to have those kinds of issues. Um, but so a lot of people enjoy feeding birds, but we recommend this time of year that people start bringing in their bird feeders, particularly if they live where bears are more common, which is in mostly Northern Maine, Northern, Western and Eastern Maine. So along the coast, particularly Southern coast, um, you may be less concerned about having a bear in your backyard. But um, so just cleaning up bird feeders and then garbage, um, people store garbage cans often in outbuildings or even on your deck or porch and then bringing it out, you know, on, onto the curb in the morning for trash pickup. And so there's food that's easily accessible to bears and bird seed, particularly those sunflower seeds, um, bears really like those. They have a good fat content. Um, it's something they seek out in the spring. What about chicken coops and chicken feed and beehives? Are those other, uh, are those concerns as well? Yeah, so we have a lot of interest in backyard farming and growing your own food. And so that's led to a lot more um, backyard farming, which is great, uh, but it also provides different attractants too for bears. And so just as you mentioned, um, not only are the small livestock an attractant, but their feed is an attractant. So thinking about where you store your feed. Uh, and then the, uh, beekeeping is really on the rise. People enjoy having their own honey. And um, my son actually was keeping bees for a while. So I know that experience well. And and uh, bears really like to get into the hives. They really like the insects that are in the hives. And so electric fence is a great way to protect those. Uh, so there's just a lot of different things that are in your backyard that can attract a bear. So if, if someone is experiencing a bear in their backyard, what are some steps that they can take to, uh, you know, you mentioned bringing in the bird feeders. Are there any other things that people can do to prevent problems or issues with bears? Yeah, what I like to say to people this time of year is we're thinking about spring cleaning, you know, whether that's inside your home or out in your yard. And so if you're raking up your leaves or starting to plant your gardens, start looking around your yard and asking yourself what might be there that a bear would be attracted to. So um, like I mentioned, is your garbage being stored on your porch, if it is, or on a deck? Can you bring it inside to a building that that's doors and windows fully closed? So it's a secure building. Um, for people that like to keep um, or feed birds, one of the things we say is rake up any of the seed from the ground, um, bring in your bird feeders, um, bring in your bird seed. Um, for those that want to continue to feed birds, um, at least make those precautions of cleaning up any of the remaining seed on the ground, storing your seed inside, and then bringing your feeders in at night. That doesn't necessarily mean it'll prevent a bear from coming into your yard, but it'll make it less attractive. Um, the best thing to do is if you have bears in the area is to bring in your bird feeders. Um, and then grills is something else that people store outside. And everyone's getting excited to start grilling again um, because the weather's getting warmer, particularly if we have weather like we had earlier this week. And so think about cleaning up your grill after use. And if you can store it inside, that would be really helpful because um, there's still food odors and scent associated with those grills. And it's kind of a, a community issue, isn't it? If, some, if your neighbor has, isn't following the same precautions that you are, you still might see some bears coming around. That's right. And so... Um, one thing I say to folks whenever they call and they're complaining or they're concerned because they've had a bear getting into their garbage or bird feeder or inside their garage or outbuilding because their doors don't fully close um, or they've left their doors open, you know, I, you know, we talk about these common things you can do, like keep your doors closed to your garage um, and rather than leaving it open this time of year, if you're storing those kinds of things inside. But if they do everything right and their neighbor isn't aware that there's a bear problem or isn't aware what they should be doing, just because you're doing everything right doesn't mean the bear won't wander through your yard. And so it really is a community issue. If you have bears in an area, you work together to identify what might be attracting them and what you can do to, to remove or secure those attractants. And what about dumpsters? Is there something that people can do to 
I mean, a lot of people have dumpsters at the end of their driveways. What are some precautions people can take there? Yeah, so dumpsters, um, there's so many different ways, right, that, uh, that people have access or ways to remove their, their garbage waste. And so dumpsters is one that um, can be a private dumpster, you know, or can be one at a business. And unfortunately, in, in Maine, most of our lids on our dumpsters are plastic. And so that makes it really easy to get in and out of for both people, but also for wildlife. And so the best thing is to have metal top lids if you're experiencing bear problems. Um, but just to keep bears out before, beforehand, some of the things you can do is always make sure the lids and doors to that dumpster remain closed after you use them. Often people leave them open. Uh, the other thing that you can do is if the garbage is getting full, and it's starting to overflow, call your waste removal company and have them you know, come and do an earlier pickup so that you just don't have that garbage that's really easily accessible. So it's that's really the key is we're just trying to make it harder for black bears to get access to some of these food, food resources. Because as I mentioned, they're always taking a risk to come into neighborhoods and communities to get food resources. And if we make it hard for them to get those food resources, um, they're gonna be less likely to come in. Great, thanks, Jen. So there are some people asking questions about um, if they were to come into contact with a bear while walking around or in their yard. Um, people might get concerned about their safety or the safety of their livestock, pets, or family members. So what are some things for people to keep in mind and what are some safety precautions or some things they should watch out for when they're looking at bears out in the landscape? Bears are naturally wary of people. And so generally a bear that encounters people is gonna run off or flee from the area. Um, although sometimes you could accidentally surprise them. So if you left your garage door open, for example, and you have garbage or grill stored inside and you walk in and a bear's inside getting your garbage, um, that could be an opportunity to surprise a bear or there's a bear in your backyard and you come around the corner and you kind of surprise it under your bird feeder. And so what I always tell people, the best thing to do is think about giving that animal an escape route. Um, so if you, you go around the corner and you see a bear back away, um, that's the best thing you can do. Um, and then if you see a bear and you're like in the safety of your house or in a vehicle um, or another building and you see a bear in your backyard and you want them to leave the area, just make a lot of noise, um, bang pots and pans, clap your hands, um, yell at the bear, and the bear should generally uh, run off when disturbed like that. Um, so those are some of the things that you can do. If a bear isn't showing fear of people, seems, doesn't respond to those things, that's an, a time where you should call the agency and report to us that there's a bear that's maybe not behaving as you would expect them to be. Thanks, Jen. So if someone has exhausted all of these uh, solutions, uh, what are some next steps for them? What are some resources that the department has available or that are available out there for people if they're still experiencing issues with bears after taking, you know, all the precautions that they can? Yeah, so I think a couple of things they can think about doing is looking at our, our website. We have a lot of resources available on our website. Um, there's also another website, bearwise.org, that was put together by bear managers. Um, that has a lot of really helpful information. So there's some, some information you can get just on our website. Um, but then if you're really, if you've, if you've taken all the precautions and you're still having bear problems, I think at that point, it's important to call the agency. And we have seven regional offices and then offices in Bangor and Augusta. And I believe on our website, you can also find contact information. And so you can contact one of your local uh, Fish and Wildlife offices and ask to speak either to a biologist or game warden about a bear problem that you're having. And so then we can work and identify with you what might be attracting a bear. It might not be something that we've talked about because we can't cover all the bear attractants, you know, in this one hour that we have here this morning or all the different things that you could do. And so um, at that point, I would suggest that you contact us. Um, we may advise you to work with an ADC agent, an animal damage control um, agent, that is licensed and permitted um, through us um, and they might be able to help you as well. But the best, I think the best thing to do is at that point is to contact the agency and we'll work with you to help identify what's going on and what you can do. 
Great, thank you. So kind of playing off the question of, of encountering a bear, where is someone most likely to encounter a bear? Is that gonna happen just anywhere in the state or is there a region or range that bears are more likely to frequent? Yep, good question. So um, we are really fortunate here in Maine. We have one of the largest black bear populations in the Eastern United States. And so we have a lot of bears, but as most of us know, uh, Maine is pretty rural. There aren't a lot of people. And so fortunately for us, where most of our bears are or where few of our people are. So bears are most common in northern, western, and eastern Maine. As you move into central Maine, bears are starting to become more common than they were historically. So you can occasionally see bears in central Maine. But then as you move towards the coast, particularly in southern, more um, densely populated areas, we have fewer black bears. Um, doesn't mean that you won't encounter a a black bear if you live in Southern Maine, say Cape Elizabeth or some, somewhere down there, but um, there are occasions when bears do wander through town, um, but you're less likely to see a bear in Cape Elizabeth than maybe Presque Isle. So we did have some questions come in, and I think it's from a, uh, the students that are in the chat. They're, they're, very, <laughs> they're very talkative. And uh, some of them have some questions, and I, and I think this is maybe a good one to move into. Um, how do you study bears? I know you talked about it a little bit. Um, and what are some of your management goals when it comes to bears? And how is the bear population? Because there was a question about stabilizing the bear population. I think we have a pretty robust bear population here in Maine. Yes, we do. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to, <clears throat> excuse me, remember all three of those questions. So you might have to help me, Katie. But so our, our bear population is large. As I said earlier, we have one of the largest black bear populations. We estimate that we have over 35,000 black bears here in the state of Maine. Um, our population has been growing in recent years um, by two to four percent annually. Uh, fortunately, though, the public seems to be able to tolerate that number of bears. But we're starting to get concerned that that bear population is going to start to become a lot more common in the more densely populated portions of the state, like Southern Maine. And so some of our management goals are to maintain this healthy, robust bear population that we have, but also at the same time, try to minimize those potential negative conflicts and to minimize the number of bears in, in you know, Southern and, and coastal Maine. And then I think the other question that the students asked was about um, how we study them, how we learn about the bears. And so uh, we're really fortunate. Maine has the longest running black bear study in the nation. Uh, we started in 1975, radio calling black bears in Northern Maine. Uh, and then we expanded um, to central Maine in 1982 and then into Eastern Maine in 2004. So we've been studying black bears in four different areas of the state. Um, currently we have bears radio collared in three, three portions of the state, Northern Central and Eastern Maine. And so what we do, it's kind of pretty exciting, um, particularly if you're a, a new biologist, um, we hire people in the, in the spring um, that are either recent graduates in the program that have a biology background or have graduated from biology um, and have been working in the field and we, uh, go out and we trap bears in the spring. We use uh, cable foot restraint. It's a very humane trap uh, that, and trappers can use those actually to harvest bears in the state as well. And we use those to capture bears. Um, and we, uh, once we capture these bears, we sedate them, we examine them, we determine if they're male or female. We pull a tooth to determine the age because um, you can actually age a bear from the tooth. It's just like a, a tree where you have rings and you can count the age of a tree by counting the growth rings. You can do the same thing on a tooth with the use of a microscope. Um, so they put on a, a ring of growth each year so we can estimate how old the bear is. Um, and then we mark them and we place ear tags so that we know um, which animal it is. So if it shows up in the harvest, gets hit by a vehicle, killed causing damage to property or just dies of natural um, causes, we know when we first capture the animal, how long it lived and why it died. Um, but the most exciting thing, and I think maybe what got people excited about today's coffee with IFNW was the picture of the bear cubs. And so we equip a bunch of our females with radio collars. So we have between 75 and 90 females equipped with radio collars every year. And a portion of those females give birth to cubs each, each winter. 
And so we go to those dens to see how many of our females have cubs, have given birth to cubs, and then how many cubs do they give birth to? Um, typically, we, we see litters of two to three cubs. Um, but that first, first litter, you know, that female that's had her, given birth to her first litter of cubs often will give birth to maybe one or two cubs. And then as they reach older age, again, we'll see that decline and number of cubs. So that information, we're learning how many cubs are born each year, how many cubs actually make it to independence, um, because those cubs will actually come uh, stay with their mother throughout the summer and den with her the next fall. And so it, then we can see them in the den the next year and see how many cubs that were born the previous year made it through their first year of life. And then they'll merge that spring and kind of go on their own. So we use that kind of information, just knowing how many cubs are born and how many die, as well as knowing the fate of the adult animals. So we're kind of tracking, keeping track of births and births and deaths. And then we know how the population is doing. So do you mind, there are a bunch of questions coming in. You're right, the baby bear picture, the little cub is definitely attracting some attention. So could you talk a little bit about the life cycle of a bear? How many cubs are born per year? Um, and how often does the uh, sow have cubs? Yes, um, so black bears really have an interesting reproductive cycle. Uh, basically, they're kind of geared to um, increase the survival of their offspring. So females um, typically give birth to their first litter uh, between three and six years of age. In Maine, most of our females actually don't give birth at three. Their first litter is usually four to six years of age here in Maine, partly because we have, you know, uh, shorter growing seasons. Our bears take it take longer to get to a healthy weight to produce cubs. So that's um, what's going on, you know, in the spring, those three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-olds, they're going to breed. Um, and then over the summer, that even though they have a fertilized egg, which is really exciting and interesting, that fertilized egg doesn't actually implant and start to develop until the fall. And so they actually have a two-month gestation period in November that if the female is reproductively fit, you know, she has enough resources to make it through the winter den and produce milk for her cubs, that... Um, fertilized egg is going to implant and then start to develop. And then two months later in January, cubs will be born. And so I think I said in my other question uh, that we typically see bears giving birth to cubs anywhere from um, four to six years of age. And then those younger females are going to give birth to smaller litters, but on average, they're going to give birth um, to two to three cubs. Very rarely do we see litters of four. Um, I'm not even sure that we've even seen that many litters of five. Um, if you go to the more Southern parts of the country where you have longer growing seasons, you'll often see larger litters. Um, and then I guess the final question that I think I heard was how often do they produce? So that's another thing that also increases the survival of their offspring. Not only do they wait to see if they have the fat reserves to produce a litter, but then once they've given birth to that litter, those cubs stay with the mother um, when they emerge from the den in the spring. So they're born in January in the winter den. They emerge from the den in the spring. And then they're learning how to forage on natural foods from their mother throughout the spring, summer, and fall. And then they're going to enter the den with their mother. And then in January, celebrate their first birthday in the den with their mother. So she's not going to produce cubs when she has cubs from the previous year with her. And then those cubs will uh, stay with her in the den. And when they emerge in the spring, we'll, we'll move on. And so um, females produce cubs every other year. Jen, you won't believe how many questions are coming through. So I do see a lot about uh, what bears eat. And one of the, the kids asked about uh, why bears eat honey and, and just natural foods that they'll find on the landscape. So how does natural food um, play a part in bear reproduction? No, oh, great question. So I'll, bears, I'll start a little bit with their diet and then talk about the role of natural foods. So they have their bears are really considered omnivores, but a lot of their um, diet is vegetation. So in the spring, like I said, that's when they're emerging from their den, they've been living off their fat reserves. That's when they're really looking for a lot of food. Uh, again, in the fall, they're looking for a lot of food because they're trying to put on their winter weight. 
Um, and so uh, often the spring, we'll see, that's when we'll see more of like a meat or protein based diet for bears. They're going to be um, turning over rocks or digging into logs, looking for insect larvae. And actually they're less interested in the honey um, in hives, but more interested in the insect larvae that are in the hives. And so um, that, those are some of the things that we can see happening in the springtime. So if you spend a lot of time in the woods and you see a rock that's been flipped over or a log that's been dug into or a stump, um, that's a could be a bear looking for um, insect larvae and grubs. Um, and then also they'll feed on carrion in the spring. Uh, and sometimes there's a, a brief window of time when uh, deer fawns and moose calves are pretty vulnerable and um, that black bears can be effective predators of deer fawns and moose calves. But it's just for a short brief window when um, deer fawns and moose calves are fir first born that that occurs. But largely their diet is vegetation. So in the spring and early summer, as soon as berry crops start to ripen, they're gonna eat a lot of those berry crops. Um, they also focus on a lot of nuts. So if you think about any kind of berry producing tree out there or bush, that's a, a potential bear food. So we're thinking cherry, um, raspberry, strawberry, blueberries. Um, and then you think about your nuts, there's hazelnuts and there's beech and acorn and just a variety of different natural foods like that. So bears have a very diverse diet and natural foods really uh, play a key role in our bear population. So what we see is natural foods tend to be high one year and low the next. And so actually this year, 2021, um, is a year where we're expecting to have better food for bears than last year. Last year, what, um, typically even numbered years tend to be a poor natural food year, has a lot to do with just the um, cycles of certain different food crops that are out there, but also uh, weather also plays a role. So uh, what we see when natural foods like this year, natural foods will be more abundant we typically see fewer bear conflicts. When there's more natural foods out on the landscapes, bears don't need to take that risk to come into communities looking for food resources. Uh, then the other thing that we also see as uh, it impacts our harvest in the fall. So when natural foods are really abundant in the fall, they're less likely to come into a hunter's bait site because you can hunt bears in Maine with the use of bait. And uh, when natural foods are out there, they prefer those over uh, a, a hunter's bait because again, there's a risk associated with coming into that food resource. So they're less likely to see that or take that risk. And so we see a lower harvest in a good natural food year. And the other thing we see, and I talked a little bit about how cubs will actually den up with their mother the next winter. And so in a good food year, those cubs that were born in a good food year, we're gonna see healthier yearlings they're gonna be about twice as heavy as cubs that are born in a poor food year. So natural foods really, really influences black bears and we see it in a lot of different ways. Thank you. And you touched on, on uh, baiting a little bit and I know that there was an increase in hunting um, and we saw some, some good participation in the summer of 2020. Uh, hunting is part of the way that you manage the bear population, right? Yes, so we have, like I said, from the onset, we have this really large, robust population that's healthy. And so it provides us an opportunity for people to hunt um, that species. And also hunting helps us manage those numbers. And so as we talked about, our bear population really occurs in the less densely populated portions of the state where we have fewer people. And so our goal is to maintain that population there, keep them healthy but try to reduce colonization into some of those more heavily human populated areas of the state. And so hunters help us. And so we know from collecting all of our data that we can um, sustain a harvest about 15% of the population. And so our goal is to remove 15% of the bears each year because the births um, rate will help re um, recover those bears that are lost due to hunting. And if we don't remove those bears, we'll have more cubs being born that are lost each year and the population will grow. And so we use that information to help inform our harvest goals. And so this year, COVID was great in terms of getting people outside. You know, there were a lot of other things that were unfortunate about the pandemic, but I think one of the benefits of the pandemic was that um, 
people got outside and started doing some activities. And so fortunately we did see an increase in hunter participation. Um, it was also a poor natural food year. So we saw both an increase in participation, but also an increase in harvest that was probably tied a little bit to both. You know, we had more hunters out there, which was great. Um, more people interested in hunting black bears um, and enjoying that opportunity. Um, and then um, it got us closer to our harvest goals um, by, by removing, you know, that surplus of bears from the population this year. Great, thanks. And um, I've heard that bear meat is delicious. Is it good table fare? It's actually one of my favorite um, game species to eat. I don't get a bear that often in our home, but um, I have a family of hunters. And so um, they have less success. Bear hunting is challenging. Um, it requires a lot of time, but we do occasionally have bear meat at home. And I like it, it's, it's just less gamey um, to me than deer and moose. Um, I think a lot of people are kind of interested in eating game. It's, you know, natural food source where they're, you know, ranging on um, natural, natural vegetation. And so it's just a healthy alternative. So a lot of people are interested in that. And uh, I really think it's excellent. I think the biggest um, concern is we don't have a lot of bear hunters in Maine. Uh, so a lot of people don't know how to properly uh, handle a bear after they harvest it. And so it's not like uh, deer where we hang a deer after you harvest it and let kind of settle out for a few days. A bear is much more similar to a moose. It's a big bodied animal, it's got a thick coat. And so it's really, really important to cool that animal down. Um, and so if you take really good care of your meat, it's really excellent. And so actually this past year, we put out a bear hunter guide um, and that's a really good resource at, for anyone that's interested to, in bear hunting for the first time. It provides you with inf all kinds of information about bear hunting, what kind of opportunities you have, but also provides you with the tools so that if you are successful in harvesting a bear, you know how to handle that meat and preserve as much of the meat as you can, and then also get some recipes. And I think you just told me we just put out some uh, cooking videos and that included bear meat. So those are some exciting new resources that we have. Um, I think everybody should try bear meat. It's excellent. I did post the links to that in the chat so people can take a look at those. The videos that we made are, are pretty cool. So I'm excited about sharing those. So we have so many questions and comments coming through, Jen. And one that I think is particularly interesting is uh, the question about how does someone become a bear biologist? So what do you what do you have to study and how long do you have to study to become a bear biologist? It's a pretty unique and interesting position. Yes. So um it's kind of interesting and maybe I'll give a little bit of my backstory because I know there's a bunch of fifth and sixth graders on here today. And so probably about that same age, I read a book about a bear biologist and a young girl that was really um, interested in photography, but was opposed to bear hunting. And so she started spending a lot of her time around the hunter check stations. So that introduced me to the field of, of um, wildlife biology. So I didn't grow up in the internet age or have these kind of opportunities. And so I learned about you know, that field. And so at a very young age, I, I decided I wanted to be a biologist and it, you know, bears intrigued me right from the get-go. Um, and so it's what you need to do, I guess, um, particularly for those students out there is, is prepare for college. You need to go to college and get a degree. And so there's actually some excellent universities right here in our own state that have excellent wildlife management programs. I graduated from the University of Maine and got my degree in wildlife management. Um, then I went on to graduate school. Not everybody does that, but I went on to graduate school and, and worked with um, black bears for my master's. But one of the things that's really nice, um, and so maybe I'm putting in a big plug for the University of Maine, but uh, the University of Maine's wildlife program uh, really requires students to get out there and get some experience while they're a student. And, so, and at one point, at least when I graduated, it was a course requirement. You had to have at least one summer job in the field. And so I was lucky that our Bangor office, which is where our bear program runs out of, was very close to Orno. And I wanted to be a bear biologist. And so I stopped in. So it takes initiative, I think. Um, I stopped into the main fish and wildlife office and um, introduced myself and was able to get on to the bear program and 
as an undergrad. And so I tagged along as a volunteer. Um, and then I got hired the summer I graduated to trap black bears. And so um, just looking for those opportunities, really um, pushing and being motivated. It's not an easy field to get into. There are not a lot of jobs out there. And so if you want it, you just really need to have that drive and, and kind of that attitude to stick with it and see what you can accomplish. Jen, what was the name of the book you mentioned about the girl who was interested in bears? I, so many people have asked me. And so I was just a kid and I had never kept the book and I've even had, <laughs> and so I don't remember it, but I know it featured um, Gary Alt was a bear biologist out of Pennsylvania. And I actually got to work for him who the author had actually spent some time when she wrote that book. Um, and so, but I've had people try to find it um, when I've done other interviews, cause I've mentioned that book. And so I, I'm guessing it wasn't like highly published, but it was in the bookstore in the town I grew up and I never kept the book. So I don't remember the title. So maybe something, do some Google research. Yes. And if you out. find it, let me know because yes. I have people ask and nobody can find it. So I, there are a lot of questions coming in about bears being dangerous. Um, why are there, you know, we hear about bear attacks in other states, but not necessarily here. So are bears dangerous and what are precautions people should take? Yeah, so bears like any wild animal have the potential to be dangerous, uh, but most bears are wary, of, naturally wary of people. And so typically you don't need to be too concerned about black bears uh, here, particularly in the East. But um, as our bear populations are growing, we're seeing you know, more negative encounters with black bears. And so I think probably the, the most important thing that we can uh, do to kind of keep bears wild and, and that have that natural fear is what we started talking about at the onset is really making your backyards less attractive to black bears because every time they take a risk and come into a community and then they get some reward without a negative encounter, that causes them to lose their fear. And that's what we're seeing, I think, more in the, on the East Coast than maybe in the Western United States is that um, bears are just getting more accustomed to people and coming into towns and getting access to garbage and bird seed and those kinds of things. And so if we, I think that's probably the biggest thing we can do is, is take those preventative measures. And I know it's not easy. Um, it takes altering your, your natural behavior or even sometimes giving up a favored activity like bird watching at your bird feeder for a couple of months. But it really is something that I think can help keep bears wild, keep them where they, they should be. So Jen, there were some questions coming in about bears and ticks. Are bears affected by ticks the same way that people are or even winter tick the way that moose can be? Yeah, so fortunately, bears um, don't have a lot of ticks, but occasionally they can. And there's actually some research being done at the University of Maine um, looking to see if bears actually either reduce the, the preponderance of like Lyme disease and some of the tick-borne issues, um, or if they actually um, help spread it. And so sometimes, you know, they can have both positive and negative effects. And so they're doing some research. So that'll be interesting. I think it just started a year ago. So I'm not sure what they've learned yet. But unlike moose, we don't see those impacts of having these high tick loads that can cause mortality of, of young bears like we see with moose. Great, thank you. And there are some questions. Actually, something just came in. Can we make sure to have time to talk about Canada lynx? Today's conversation is really focused on bears, but I'm hoping that Jen enjoys this experience enough to come back on and have another coffee chat with me, maybe more focused on Canada lynx. Do you think that's a good idea, Jen? Yeah, I'll, I'll come back. That'll be fun. Yeah, that, uh, we could have a whole conversation, I'm sure, about, about Canada Lakes. So what are some causes of mortality for bear? I know that starvation can be an issue and maybe other, uh, other bears and some, um, some density issues. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so black bears um, really are most vulnerable to like natural sources of mortality in their first couple of years of life. Once they reach adulthood, you know, four years or older, their chance of mortality diminishes. Uh, because it's those first few years of life that they're, you know, um, when they're young, um, they're most vulnerable. This, and as they grow um, and 
and leave their mother and start kind of going out on the landscape looking for an area to call home, that's when they're most vulnerable because they're going to encounter other bears, they're going to encounter roads or maybe even go into communities. And so mortality is high as those first few years when either bears are small shortly after birth and emergence from the den um, up until when they're, they finally find a home, home range to settle in. Um, and then once they reach adulthood, mortality is pretty low. Um, so they, the bears are really long lived. They can live into their thirties. Um, disease and starvation are very, very minor sources of mortality. And so until they reach old age, we really see um, black bears having high, high survival rates. And so that's why um, hunting is a ma an important management tool. Bears have very few natural predators um, and they're just really disease resistant. Great, thank you, Jen. Um, let's see here if we have some other quick questions. So bird feeders, we do have some more questions coming in about bird feeders and just keeping your yard safe. So if we are taking our bird feeders in at night, when is it okay to start putting them out again? I know a lot of people are very interested in birding now. It's one of the, those things that you can do to enjoy your backyard. And I'm sure a lot of people are interested in, in the Bird Atlas project and some of those other citizen science projects that we have going on. So um, what are some considerations there for birders and people with bird feeders? So I guess maybe we could talk about timing a little bit. So bears are most active or they're out on the landscape because they're not in their winter dens from April to November 1st. So if you live in an area that sees a lot of bears and experiences problems with bears, you really need to be thinking about that April to November window. But um, the majority of our bear conflicts occur during the months of June and July. So those are our peak months, um, but they start as early as April. And so you know, for those that really want to um, enjoy some of those activities, I would say maybe at least see some, you know, in April, May, and June and July. Um, and then if you really are having a hard time with that, um, at least try to avoid the months of June and July where are our peak months for bear conflicts. Uh, but then again, the other things that you can do again is rake up any seeds, store your seed inside, get rid of any attractants, just make your yard less um, interesting. And I think I did see, and we'll have to dig it up and try to put it on our website, but I think Wisconsin um, is making a, um, there's somebody in Wisconsin making a kind of bird bear proof um, bird feeder pole. I don't know that much about it, but there are in innovative ways that people try to feed birds and limit access um, to the bird seed to anything but birds. Um, it can be challenging, but um, there are potential opportunities out there. And, and if we find some that are pretty successful, we'll start sharing those on our website. Thank you. Yeah, and we do have some of the, the bear conflict information on our website, and we did share the, the link for that. So what, there was a question that just came in, if someone sees an injured bear, what should they do? Yeah, so I think probably what we see more than injured bears are orphaned cubs. Um, and so one thing to be thinking about this time of year, these cubs that were born in January are emerging from their winter dens with their mothers and they're gonna be um, moving around on the landscape. But these first few months, that's when they're less mobile, uh, they're still growing. And so the mothers often will put their bear cubs up a tree while they go and forage on natural foods. And so often people will find these bears and, and sometimes we call them babysitting trees. You know, these trees are basically where the female puts the cubs so that they're safe while she's off foraging. And so if you see bear cubs out there on the landscape, you know, when you're out hiking or birding or whatever you're doing, um, just, just keep in mind that it, this could be a babysitting tree that the, the female has put the cubs in, that they're not really abandoned. Um, and so, but if, if you frequent the area and you're seeing these cubs there every day and they're, they're coming out of the tree and seem desperate, those are when maybe you want to pick them up that something might have happened to the mother where she might have gotten hit by a vehicle or, um, you know, something could have happened to that mother and then now, now those cubs are abandoned. But generally, um, we don't have those issues in terms of 
uh, bear cubs that need to be picked up. But if you do find one, don't pick them up, call us first so that we can evaluate for you um, whether it is, is something that we should be concerned about or if it's just you know, a mother bear that's left her cubs while she's gone off to forage for natural feeds. Right, it's so the best course of action. Go to our website. You can find the regional office that's closest to you and contact uh, one of the, the numbers there, either a biologist or a game warden, right, Jen? Yes, yep, that's the best way to reach us um, and just let us know what's going on. And, you know, I think always it's better, better to err on the uh, side of caution and call us and ask a question um, rather than intervene and mis do something by mistake. So another question that just came in, are male bears territorial? Yes, so that those are good questions. So bears have home ranges um, and they overlap, and, but they will they um, will tolerate them, other bears, but male, males particularly are more tolerant of female bears. And so a, a female home range will overlap um, a male home range and males are less tolerant of other male bears. And how big do bears get? Yep. So a f adult female bear typically in Maine, you know, averages in the 200 pound range. Sometimes they can get a little bigger. Um, males can um, get up to 80, 800 pounds or more. But I, I want to say that the um, record bear in Maine is somewhere around like the high 600s. Um, so we haven't seen a bear that's in Maine that has reached 800. So on average, your males are going to be three to 300 to 400 pounds and your females are going to average around 200 pounds. Great. Thanks, Jen. So another question that came in, if someone is hiking and they encounter a bear or even maybe camping, there is that possibility, of course, what are some things that people can do to stay safe? Yes, so um, one of the things we, we do have some good resources on our website. Again, it's a brochure about what to do if you encounter bears because it'd be hard for me to cover every scenario. But um, the most important thing that we recommend when hiking is to hike in groups. Um, and then when if you were to encounter a bear, um, to stay together, that's the most important thing you can do. Don't, don't separate. Um, and then one thing that we have learned about some of the bear attacks, and again, bear attacks are extremely rare, but when they do occur, it often involves dogs. And so people enjoy um, hiking and recreating with dogs. Um, what happens if a dog is off leash and they smell a bear, they're often gonna run and investigate that smell. And then when they, they encounter that bear, they run back to their owners. And so they inadvertently bring that bear back to their owners. And so that's where we've seen either injuries um, to people or to pets. And so what we recommend is when hiking is to keep your dog on a leash um, or under you know, voice control so that they're close by. Um, and then the other thing that I always say that people can do if it makes you more comfortable is to hike with a walking stick. Um, in the event that you encountered, and this would be extremely rare where you needed to defend yourself um, from a bear, um, you already have a way to defend yourself with that walking stick. So maybe that also gets at some of the concerns in that rare um, instance where you um, encounter a bear where physical contact is made, the recommendation is that you fight back uh, with any means at hand, kicking, um, hitting it with rocks or sticks. So that's what we know about black bears is that um, people survive bear attacks from, from black bears if they fight back. Thanks, Jen. So another question that came in and um, is about whether bears truly hibernate. So when do bears den and is it dependent on available food? So that's one of my favorite questions. Um, and there's a really good article on that bearwise.org um, site that talks about bears. Are they really hibernators? And so the terminology goes back and forth, but your true hibernators um, they drop, what the big difference is, is they drop their body temperature to about freezing. Um, they lower their metabolism. They lower their heart rate and their respiration. Black bears do all those things, except for their body temperature doesn't drop to that freezing level. So bears respiration declines when they're in the winter den, their heart rate declines, their metabolism declines. 
but their body temperature only declines by like, I believe like 12 degrees. And so black bears also differ from true hibernators. True hibernators actually will kind of wake up occasionally to eat or drink, but bears don't eat or drink while they're in their winter den. They live off their fat reserves and they can um, actually recycle their waste material. And so they don't urinate or defecate um, when they're denning, which is also different from true hibernators. So um, on that bearwise.org website, they call them super hibernators, um, which I think is an interesting terminology because of that, you know, that um, bears um, can actually recycle their waste material, live off their food reserves. But the other interesting thing, black bears, um, because they're in their winter den from the month of November to April, typically, they're actually able to heal from any injuries. So if they got hit by a vehicle or wounded while during the hunting season or have any kind of injury while they're in the winter den, they can actually heal from those wounds and then emerge in good health where most other wildlife, if they have a broken bone or some other injury, they have to go out and forage and try to survive every day. And so those will cause more mortality and like deer or moose than they would with a black bear. So that's kind of an interesting term, super hibernators, just because they, you know, they have that ability to live off their fat reserves, recycle their waste, and then, um, and then also heal from any injuries. So I think they're pretty neat in terms of uh, uh, their, their winter survival skills. Amazing. So can you talk a little bit about bears senses? Someone asked if they have a good sense of smell. Do they have good eyesight and hearing? Is it kind of like my dogs who can hear the, the car down the street driving and they get a little bit antsy? Yeah, so they have all the, all those senses are pretty good. Black bears have small eyes so that so they have maybe poor eyesight than some other wildlife, but actually they have very good eyesight. Um, they have a really large nose. So anybody interested in thinking about what animals might have good senses. Think about the size of their noses, their eyes, their ears. And so that kind of helps identify what kind of attributes are they're more geared to. So bears, of course, have a large nose. So they have a really tremendous sense of smell. They have fairly good sized ears, so they have good hearing. And despite having small eyes, they have, they have fairly good eyesight. And so um, another thing that people often get concerned about is maybe a bear that's standing on its hind legs. So bears typically, of course, wander around on four feet, but occasionally they'll stand up on their hind feet. And people think of that as an act of aggression, but they actually can hear, smell, and see better when they're standing on two feet than they can on four. So if there's something that's gotten them curious, that's why they're going to stand up. They just want to get a better sense of what's around them. So Jen, I know I asked this a couple of different times, but there are still questions coming in regarding bear mortality. So what are some natural causes um, for, for bears to, to actually die? Is it starvation, disease? Yeah, so um, as I said, the mortality is the highest in those younger age classes. So if you look at your cubs, the ones that are born in, the, in January, those cubs that are born to females that don't have the fat reserves to produce enough milk are going to be more likely to die of starvation. Um, and then occasionally um, we'll also see those cubs when they first emerge from their dens, even though the females will often leave them in those, you know, babysitting trees or nursery trees, um, they can be vulnerable to predators. So again, it's just like moose calves and deer fawns. The, soon after they emerge from the dens, that's when they're less mobile, more vulnerable to predation. So it's also another short window. So cubs, they're more likely to be killed by a predator or die of starvation than any of the other age classes. Um, your yearlings, which was the next year, we're gonna see some starvation losses. So when I talked about um, natural food years being a real driving factor in years when natural fo foods are really poor, um, we can see some really low weight yearlings and some of them will not make it through their den. Um, so that's probably the next age class that is pretty vulnerable to mortality. And then 
um, when they're about a year and a half, that's when they go out and try to find their own home range. Um, and so that's where they're going to be more vulnerable to mortality. That's where they're going to encounter roads, encounter other bears as they're seeking their own home range or territory to live in. Um, and so that's when they're most vulnerable. Uh, we don't see a lot of disease here in Maine. Some parts of the country, they've seen incidents of mange and particularly that younger age class, it's a lot like the winter tick with moose, where if you have mange, so that's a, um, a parasite that causes hair loss. Um, those bears, if particularly those young, it's very similar to the winter tick, um, can cause those bears to lose body condition and die. We haven't seen, I think maybe one or two cases here in the state. Um, so that's not something that's very common. Uh, again, other disease issues are fairly rare. Okay, great. That, thanks, Jen. So another question about the cubs, are there incidences of triplets um, and how big are the, are the cubs at different uh, stages? I know the, pit, the cub in the picture for this, for this chat was awfully small. Yep. So cubs, um, we definitely have triplets. So cubs, litters of two and three are the most common here in Maine. So a female that's produced a litter before is kind of in you know, that, that prime age of producing young, you know, often older, older than six, but maybe less than 20. Um, she's going to give birth to two to three cubs and probably three cubs more common than two. Um, so litters of three are very common. Uh, when cubs are born in January, again, they had that really short gestation period, even though they breed in the spring, that embryo doesn't start to develop until November. And so they only have about two months to grow in the uterus before they're born. So they, they weigh just a few ounces when they're born. Uh, and then their, their eyes are closed, their ears are small and pinned back, and they're almost hairless. And so the picture that you have, I think in the, in the teaser for this program was a bear cub in March. And so typically they're born around the 1st of January and by March, their eyes are open. Uh, their ears are much more like a, what you would expect for a bear and they're fully, fully um, have a good fur coat. And so they're very furry. That was a tongue twister there, but uh, they're just a really cute at that stage. And that's at three months and they're ready to kind of go out and start um, moving about the landscape and following mom. And then by next year, if food conditions are really good, they're still gonna be slightly smaller than their mother. You're gonna tell that they're um, not a full adult, but they're gonna weigh anywhere around 40 to as high as 70 or 80 if food, food is um, really good that year. So Jen, in our, in our final minutes here, I have a, there are a lot of questions about I guess it's, it's sort of related mostly to bear and human conflicts and how we interact with one another. So I guess my final question might be in the last few minutes that we have here, can bears and humans coexist with each other? Is that possible? We have been for years, for decades, uh, coexisting with black bears. So I think, yes, it's obvious that we can. I think uh, the best thing that we, <laughs> my, my dog's in the background there. Um, so the best thing, like I said, is, is really um, thinking ahead and altering your behaviors. You know, if you have trash pickup in the morning, um, that's curbside pickup, think about bringing your trash to the curb in the morning, not the night before, you know, bringing in your bird feeders, bringing, storing your grills inside, doing things to make things less attractive. That's how we can coexist because bears that, um, are willing to take that risk to come into a community are more likely to um, get hit by vehicles or get shot um, by that homeowner that's just not comfortable having a bear in their backyard and so or causing significant damage you know so those are the things that we really want to do to coexist is think about what we can do it's going to change it's going to require that we change our behaviors and it's going to require some time but that's how we truly can coexist with black bears. Great, thank you so much for joining me today, Jen. This has been a really fun conversation. I love personally talking about black bears with Jen. So this was pretty fun for me selfishly. <laughs>
And uh, so next month, I will be uh, continuing this series, Coffee with MDIFW, and chatting with another one of our, our staff members here about conservation, management, and recreation over some coffee. And I do have coffee. You can't see it when I take a sip because the camera's not on me. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And thank you, Jen, for joining us. Well, this was great. Have a good day, everybody.